So, I'm Doug Kell. I'm currently C at the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, and I'm also what's called the Research Council Executive Champion for Open Access. I'm also one day a week still at the University of Manchester, and I actually do publish in this sort of space, so, so know a little bit about it. Many of these things are going to be familiar to much of this audience, and therefore I'm going to canter through quite a lot of this, indicating mainly what the Research Councils UK are doing, people know, and, and, and Liz has just given a nice talk about how the publishers are responding to the re requests, or if you prefer, the demands of the Research Councils to make the open access thing happen. There isn't any doubt that we're all for it. We want to ha it to happen in an orderly way. Many of the reasons are extremely well known. From the bottom-up point of view, I'm going to concentrate, uh, just mention on the uh, third bullet point, the open access citation advantage. There are a few papers showing that there isn't one and a very great, the in larger number showing that there is one and that is a carrot for researchers to recognise that if they publish open access they will get more cited. The second bullet from bottom I regard as particularly important. From the scientific point of view, given that two papers a minute are being published in PubMed alone, five peer reviewed per minute overall, nobody can read them, therefore Nobody can possibly have the best thoughts about all the things that they could know about because they haven't read about them, but computers could. And these kinds of things are going to make much better science to be done. This is part of the rigor thing. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about some of the fancy doodahs that can happen. And there's a whole session this afternoon. From the perspective of open access and rigor, I think I follow what other people have thought. This is known and normal as part of science. That what you claim to be true can be demonstrated to be true by making the data, facts and everything else available has always been part of the scientific process. What the digital age allows is to make that more swiftly and easily checkable and, Mark made this point as well, allows better collaboration which helps with the statistical powering of otherwise uh, of experiments that small sample sizes wouldn't provide the statistical power. And several people have commented on the Royal Society publication, and there's a quotation from that there. From the rigor point of view, I don't know if people know this fairly well-known paper from, from, from Ioannidis, uh, with a slightly provocative title from PLOS Medicine in 2005, and it essentially is to do with the fact that uh, if you believe through Neyman Pearson statistics that P less than 0.05 is a suitable criteria of goodness, apart from the fact that it isn't true at all, it means that quite often you will easily get that when the real number is not at all P less than 0.05, and uh, you can see a reference to a paper of my own where we have a little discussion of that, uh, and often it just comes to be that when the sample sizes are increased, in fact, the original findings disappear. So collaboration, open access, large sample sizes definitely improve rigor from a scientific point of view. And I'm just going to do one BBSRC slide. We like all of this sort of stuff because it allows you to exciting and novel kinds of innovative science and we've got a call out. In fact, the call has closed submissions were finished yesterday on crowdsourcing for the biological sciences. But I'm expected, essentially, today to talk about the RCUK open access implementation. Just a nod to the fact that we are not alone. Sir Mark mentioned that too. Lots of exciting things happening in the global context. Some gold, some green. Third bullet from the bottom. Uh, proposals before both houses in the USA to uh, mandate green open access with what some would see as quite a short embargo, which could have quite significant consequences. I'll come on to how and why the UK is favouring, but not exclusively so, the gold method. And uh, obviously the REF, which is a separate part of the dual support system, is going to have probably far more impact on researchers' thinking than anything that Research Councils UK might do. And when folks started to think of this, Dame Janet Finch was asked to chair a panel full of all of the relevant stakeholders, the five main stakeholders being there, recognising that at the outset their aims and 
objectives and desires were somewhat incompatible, and uh, I think Janet Finch's committee did an absolutely masterly job of finding a solution that wasn't perfect for anyone, but that which everyone could live with. And that is what came out of the Finch report. And the result of that was uh, a series of recommendations, all of which were accepted, save one that was to do with VAT and EU law that, that couldn't have been, and a recognition that gold for the UK should be the preferred initial route, and that it would therefore be paid for through APCs. But the quid pro quo was we would expect full CC by licensing, and then this audience knows what that is, and a series of decision trees that would lead to encourage people to publish gold where the money would be available was set in place, but a recognition that compliance would not be full from the word go, and indeed the Wellcome Trust that had been pretty heavy duty about mandating uh, open access still only had, after seven years, about a 60% compliance rate. So we recognise that this is a journey, and I'll say that uh, later, not just an event in time. And, of course, uh, the open access movement has been around a lot longer, with, with journals starting around the year 2000. A recognition that actually most of the journals of interest to researchers are, in fact, compliant with various flavours of the RCUK policy already, so we're, we're not having to push against closed doors in that sense. And a decision tree has been made that encourages people towards the gold route while recognising that the mixed economy will be part of it, and we've heard that Oxford at least is strongly encouraging some of their people to do green, uh, because a bold reading of the number of papers published and the likely cost of an APC for each of them leads you to some quite eye-watering numbers that don't sit very easily with the facts, and so we're going to have to look at that carefully, where the elasticities lie. So, after the government accepted the recommendations of the Finch report, RCUK was essentially asked to implement it, and there's some history there that I'm not going to go through in particularly great detail, because I would have thought that most of the people in this room know all about it, starting with 10 million in last September, and the block grants starting at the beginning of this month, 17 million in the first year. Still lots of discussions and consultations, select committees of the House of Lords, there's another one on the economic impact of open access publishing for the biz committee that I've got to appear before next week, and the latest version, second bullet from the bottom of the RCUK guidance is at that long URL, which you can find very easily by googling the phrase I've put in red. And recognising that somewhere between the block grants being used up in the first month and having lots of money left over at the end of the year, the truth will lie for any institution, and we don't know which of those it's going to be, although we have some suspicions. Uh, we've undertaken to have a full review of the implementation as soon as we reasonably can, which is going to be the last quarter of 2014, which will contain independent membership, uh, so that it's not just seen as RCUK making sure that the result is what we hope it will be, because we are... Neutral, we are science, we are in policy, we are evidence driven policy, and uh, if there are some obvious banana skins that remain, it is our job to make sure they are removed, and so we want to find the facts. And that, of course, involves working with everyone, all of the stakeholders listed on the Janet Finch slide, and people talk about a recognition that maybe after five years we will have transitioned fully. It may be fewer. I Strongly hope it is not more. So many things will happen in such a short time that, that predicting the details, I think, is moderately unrealistic. But the direction of travel is transparently good and correct. Mention the APCs, and as we've heard, institutions already are starting to establish their publication funds, working out how to dole out the money in sensible ways to optimise the, the relationship between the flow of money coming in and the flow of money going out, and indeed using potentially some of it to set up their institutional repositories and the infrastructure for ensuring the delivery of APCs and the open access to the publications. And we've given a little bit of guidance as to how we hope they will do it. The main point is use it to best deliver the policy. The sizes of these funds were calculated using the 
numbers of publications that we fund, which is different from the total number of publications, for instance, that was shown for Oxford at 22,000. Uh, not at all the main fraction of those are funded by RCUK. We know how many publications were funded, or at least acknowledged our funding, and that's the 26,000. And uh, using the larger number from Finch there, and uh, the average level of compliance expected, you come to the size of the block grants you should make available, and we made them available. So that's how it was calculated. Clearly, these numbers are changeable. The numbers of publications may be up, go up. The APCs may go down. They will vary, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of elasticity in the system, but you've got to start with a well-argued position to start with, and that it was and that it is where we are at currently. And it was divvied up essentially according to the number of postdocs on the grounds that Large Hadron Colliders themselves cost a lot of money but don't make papers. The people who uh, are working on project funding make the papers. And uh, it came down on, as you would expect, a zip distribution. And we had a cutoff that if an institution wasn't going to get more than 10,000 a year, we didn't give it to them because that was administratively silly. But that nevertheless accounted for more than 99% of the research councils spend by institutions. And there are a lot of uh, players helping to move the thing forward. We don't want people wasting a lot of time trying to find out if a journal is compliant when there could be a portal that will tell them in one go. We don't want uh, people setting up things that are not going to work very well when someone else has set up one that works transparently much better and bringing together all of the best practice stuff and a recognition that what I'll just call a spectrum of understanding exists amongst the many learned societies, some of whom are more up to snuff than others on what it's all going to mean and we want them therefore to talk to each other to make sure that they share best practice as well and we're trying to make that happen. And as I mentioned, we are going to have this evidence-based review in the, uh, a year and a half's time. I think most of the people in this room know all about CC BY and why we like it, and the fact that it's been going on for a long time, especially in the biomed journals, it's true, which has tended to be the driver of this sort of thing. Uh, also, in a slightly parallel track, there's recognition that there was a Hargreaves report that proposes it, things in the open access space that are going to allow one to add value and to do exciting things with open access publications. Uh, the minutiae, this is a bit techie, but the minutiae of CC by NC are a bit odd, to put it mildly, still, and I think we, we think they could produce some problems. And there are folk with concerns, which I don't think are particularly correct concerns, about on-licensing of third-party rights because you don't on-license them now. And I'll just give an example. I, last OA paper I published, or fairly recent one, included a bit of proprietary software plus a load of our own. We gave away a load of our own and said, but you can't have that, you have to ask the original license holder because that's the way it works. So it's not particularly onerous business. And at the same time, we're asking people to be much more upfront and explicit in the acknowledgement section of their papers as to what was funded, by whom, and why, and also moving from the open access and the publication side to the open data and access to the materials, be much more upfront and open about that. It's not in a sense new. There's a whole lot of stuff about what research councils provide. We're now moving much more towards being a bit heavy about compliance as part of this move to the open everything agenda. Now, of course, in, in Biomed, we've had PubMed for years, and why then are we therefore insisting that we're much more interested in the full papers and not just the abstracts, and there's a, a paper there, only looked at 29 uh, examples, but if you read through the papers, which was done by a human being, and you ask how many claims were in the body of the papers that do not appear in the abstracts, 92% of them did not appear in the abstracts, only 8% did. And if you're a quantitative biologist like me, you never see all the numerical data in the abstract, so uh, that's completely useless. So much value to be had by having access to the full papers. And one area that we're personally particularly interested in is text mining. It has three stages. The first is retrieving the information, and that bit requires the open access. Once you've got that, you can then do what Mark was talking about, turning data into information and knowledge, just as, the, as is, is written there. Um, but without the open access, you can't do any of this stuff, and you need it to be from the full papers. And in Manchester, we've got a centre that does this kind of stuff, and I've worked with them. 
Just going to finish here with one example of a couple of my own papers. You can see in red the number of references that are in those papers. The first one was all of my spare time for about a year, reading every one of them, downloading them one at a time, not having any real tools that uh, allowed me to cross-reference things in a useful way. And even towards the end of writing that thing, I was finding papers in Nature Family Review journals that hadn't cited any of the other papers that I had so far consulted. Scientists live in silos. Part of the problem is the two papers a minute. They solve the problem by pretending it's not happening and therefore only reading a very small subset of the literature. This does not buy you the best science. I mean, not to over-egg those papers, but the consequence of this was the discovery of a lot of stuff that would cross-cut across a whole bunch of diseases, most of which didn't cite each other at all. And so my argument is that having open access to all of this stuff is going to buy you better science. So, in conclusion, RCUK is implementing the Finch recommendations. It's happening both with momentum and more particularly with money. Explain the reason why the UK prefers gold at this stage and a recognition that we will have a mixed economy. We are very much on a journey, it's an exciting journey, and the UK publishes about 6% of the world's scholarly output and uh, clearly what we do alone is not going to change the world but we will have potentially the first mover advantage. There are other elements of changes in copyright, some discussions going on in the EU and there are some other discussions going on in the context of Hargreaves Plus Plus but the main message is that these changes, the threat is doing nothing I'm not going to go on about HMV and Blockbuster who didn't change their business models and got squished by changes in digital happenings, but that is the world that happened. The opportunities are far more important. Having access to all of this stuff is going to allow a lot of novel products and value to be added by those who do them, and many have already started to do that, and some of these things we'll hear a little bit about this afternoon. And with that, I will stop and thank you for your kind attention.